My title is Virus Structure Transmission Patterns, the Unusual Case of Coronaviruses. So I think if you asked many virologists, they, uh, if there was a relationship between the structures that viruses have and how they move between hosts, they'd probably scratch their heads and say, yeah, there, there probably is. But it hasn't been studied very carefully. And so we wanted to study that and, did a, and published a paper on this last year. And one thing that stood out was that uh, coronaviruses are kind of unusual. And in fact, it gets us to thinking about something that came up in Stan's talk, which is possible fecal oral transmission um, of coronaviruses and particularly SARS-CoV-2. So let me go over that and uh, we'll get to uh, SARS-CoV-2 and fecal oral transmission at the end. So we wanted to carry out a rigorous study of the relationship of viral structures and transmission modes. So we made a, a, a detailed database of this. So we categorized viral particle structures as enveloped or not, containing RNA or DNA, and whether they were filamentous, spherical in shape, bullet formed, or pleomorphic, which means messy, lots of different shapes. We also cataloged transmission modes. We broke it into transmission modes into 12 categories. These are somewhat um, overlapping. You could fuse categories or separate them further, but Categories were fecal oral, uh, arthropod born, that is arboviruses moved around by uh, arthropods, inhalation of aerosols, inhalation of dried material, sex, eating, oral bloodstream tra transmission, typically biting, breastfeeding, vertical transmission to mother to by, uh, by infection of the fetus or during delivery, vertical transmission by germline integration via blood products, or via contact, uh, commonly skin or eyes with droplets, bodily fluids, or fomites. And so um, we studied viruses from six vertebrate hosts, including humans, dogs, cats, pig, cows, horses, and chickens, 247 virus host pairs, so that's uh, 1,400 viral structural features, and 2,964 transmission modes. And what we did um, uh, that hadn't been done before was really carefully scoured the literature, some of it computationally driven with standardized search terms, so that for each of the transmission modes, here's an example of our table, each row is a virus, we we're able to annotate with um, literature saying that a transmission mode did indeed uh, support transmission of a certain virus or not if our search was negative. And so that's summarized over here. Um, each row is a virus, each column is a structural property or a transmission mode. So this gave us something we could compute on. So Scott Sherrill Mix worked out a, an interesting statistical framework for this. Um, it, it was a hard problem statistically because viruses are maybe related by descent. They're not fully independent. So this had to take case on a, be, the an analysis took place on a phylogenetic tree respecting the non-independence in the structure. And we saw some quite notable patterns. So one strong one was that lipid uh, viruses that have lipid envelopes are negatively associated with fecal oral transmission. And this makes sense. The lipid envelope is fragile. It can't survive the detergent effects of bile salts in gut. It can't survive drying um, uh, after ingestion, uh, stomach acids, uh, proteases, stuff like that. It makes a lot of sense that lipid enclosed viruses are not transmitted by fecal oral route. And as you can see, there were some other generalizations we could make uh, as well. It was pretty interesting. But coronaviruses stood out as unusual. In so here are coronaviruses um, among all lipid enveloped viruses. The, here we've uh, the structural feature that is uh, in this column is lipid. So we're looking at lipid enclosed viruses. And then this next column is fecal oral transmission. You can see coronaviruses actually are commonly fecal orally transmitted. Not known to be the case in humans, but yes in um, uh, six out of 13 uh, animal viruses. So what's the deal with this? Coronaviruses are unusual. They're enveloped viruses, but commonly transmitted by the fecal oral route. So how can this be? Well, we consider two models. This isn't fully resolved, but it could be that coronaviruses are unusually stable, or it could be that coronaviruses are produced in the lower geon so don't need to pass through the length of the gut. And maybe it's not fecal oral, maybe virus can come out in fecal material and then uh, contact or fomites could uh, initiate the next round of infection. So what do we really know about SARS-CoV-2? 
So um, SARS-CoV-2 is uh, RNA is found at substanti in substantial levels in stool. So here's a, a recent paper in Nature. These are patient samples, uh, time on the x-axis, log 10 RNA concentration on the y-axis. And these are throat swabs, nasopharyngeal, sputum, and stool. And you can see quite high virus levels in stool in some of these patients. So uh, as we've heard, there are these human cell factors needed for virus production, uh, ACE2, the receptor, and tempers, the protease. So we went to the human protein atlas. And if you look, uh, these proteins, ACE2 and tempers, are expressed at very high levels in gut. In fact, those are the main sites of expression of these uh, cofactors for SARS-CoV-2. Uh, people have begun to look at, uh, is there virus in human stool that you can find? And there's uh, one report uh, out of China of a, a single uh, isolation of replication competent virus from patient stool. The study was not totally convincing. They placed some uh, fractions on cultured cells and assayed by electron microscopy, and they think that's a coronavirus in the EM on the bottom here. Um, obviously, a lot more of this would be useful to do. For SARS-1, replication competent virus could be isolated from intestinal biops biopsies, though not from stool. And um, the WHO studied SARS-1 uh, spiking into diarrheal stool and found it could survive for up to four days. So for SARS-CoV-2, there's a lot of uh, diarrhea associated with infection. So it really makes you wonder, are there clinical settings where, there are enough viral, where there's enough viral replication or survival in the lower GI to make fecal oral or fecal contact transmission significant in spreading SARS-CoV-2, uh, matching up with what's known to be the case for various coronaviruses in animals? So I think this is worth investigating further for the safety of healthcare workers and to try to understand the epidemic in more detail. So just to summarize briefly, uh, envelope viruses are rarely transmitted by the fecal oral route. Several vertebrate coronaviruses defy this generalization. The mechanisms are unclear. Are, do they have unusually tough particles or virus production in lower GI? I don't think we know the answer, but the, it seems like the um, some of the conditions for the second point are met. SARS-CoV-2 receptor and cofactor are highly expressed in intestine, and we see high levels of RNA in feces. One suggestion that maybe you can find replication competent virus in feces. So contact transmission could be significant for SARS-CoV-2, particularly in patients with strong diarrheal symptoms, which is uh, uh, seen in a substantial minority of patients. There was copious watery diarrhea with um, early in infection when viral titers are highest. Might you get enough uh, viral titer, enough viral survival for that to be a, a meaningful source of transmission? So all of these are testable, and I think it would be useful to go forward and do some testing. So I want to thank my coworkers, Scott, Kevin, and Haley. And again, if you're interested in all the lectures from this um, symposium, go to our Twitter site, PenCov, and um, You'll see th these lectures and other information on the epidemic.